The Western Flyer was built in 1937 in Tacoma, Washington at the Western Boat Building Company. And the Pacific Northwest had a lot of shipwrights. We had the wood, the materials, and they were turning out these boats like pickup trucks. In the 1930s, Monterey, California was a fishing hub, and the target fish was the Pacific sardine. The Western Flyer was built specifically for that sardine fishery, and that really what made Cannery Row in Monterey, California such a, a hub. The shipyard actually built four boats that year, all headed to Monterey, so it really had a very specific style and design. It participated in that fishery well into the 1940s, but as that fishery collapsed, it came back north and it began fishing off the Washington coast, targeting different fisheries along the Washington coast and actually all the way up and around into southeast Alaska. And by the 2000s, it had kind of started to fall in disrepair. It had had some hard times before that, but really the hard times we all think about was in 2013, it sank. John Steinbeck's The Western Flyer sank over the weekend again. The Western Flyer has sunk twice in the past three months, and now the U.S. Coast Guard says the boat is incapable of floating again and needs to be taken out of the water. This land developer owned the boat at this point, and on his watch, the boat actually sank tied to the dock two times back to back. And that's really when people think of the damage that we're currently dealing with with Western Flyer. The first time it was underwater for about a week, and the second time it was underwater for almost six months. It was raised and it was brought to Port Townsend in 2014, it sat out on dry land behind the shipyard, kind of where it's at currently, and it kind of was in that fate unknown. And there were several different articles, one in the New York Times that was kind of in the genre of, you know, literary icon, fate unknown. And at that point, that's when the group that owns it now stepped in and purchased it. So the Western Flyer Foundation vision was to restore the boat to a moment in time. And really our moment in time is the spring of 1940. In March of 1940, John Steinbeck and his best friend Ed Ricketts, a marine ecologist, they wanted to take a trip together. They first were going to drive to the Sea of Cortez, and they later realized that a boat was the best way to see the areas they wanted to go to. They traveled from Monterey, California to the tip of Baja Peninsula and up into the Sea of Cortez, making several stops along the way. He said that they had trouble finding a fishing boat that would take them to the Sea of Cortez. But Tony Berry said, I'll take you. And so they chartered that boat, the Western Flyer. And it was one of Ricketts' dreams to catalog all the invertebrate animals on the West Coast, really from Sitka, Alaska to Baja. After Steinbeck had published his seminal novel, The Grapes of Wrath, and Ricketts had published his seminal work, which was Between Pacific Tides. So they'd each finished major projects and Steinbeck had money and he said okay let's do this let's together go to the Sea of Cortez uh, and fulfill your dream and collect marine invertebrates. Steinbeck was born in 1902 in Salinas which is inland it's an agricultural town and it's probably one of the richest agricultural regions in California but his family also had a summer home uh, in Pacific Grove on the Monterey Peninsula. And then in 1930, when he was 28, he moved back to the family summer home because he didn't have any money. He was determined to be a writer and to make his living as a writer. During those apprentice years um, in Monterey, he would spend a lot of time with Ed Ricketts. Um, Ed Ricketts lived about a mile away from Steinbeck along the Monterey Bay. They met at a party and they were just uh, soulmates. They really um, sparked one another to think in creative ways. They both admired one another's strengths. Uh, Ricketts thought Steinbeck was a great writer, and Steinbeck really appreciated um, Ricketts' very kind of um, eclectic mind. He was a marine biologist and collected marine invertebrates and sold them to laboratories and scientific classrooms around the country. And so Steinbeck admired his profession. So it was really a friendship um, of equals and that brought out the best in one another. 
And the entire experience with John Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts was only six and a half weeks long. The John Steinbeck era is a very short period of time, and what came out of it were these co-authored books, The Sea of Cortez, and then later The Log from the Sea of Cortez by John Steinbeck. Ricketts was able to catalog many, many new species and to pick up and look at sort of the common invertebrates in the Sea of Cortez. So it was a kind of baseline survey of the Gulf of California, which was important. But in Steinbeck's writing it up, what the book is, is a kind of compendium of all their ideas that they discussed and shared throughout the 30s. It's really a record of a friendship is what it is, the book, Sea of Cortez. One reviewer said there's more of Steinbeck the man in this book than in any other. The very first big challenge of the Western Flyer was getting it into the building it currently is in. Once the boat was in and out of the weather, really kind of the first phase of the project started. It was kind of an archaeological dig. It was sifting down through years of neglect, years of additional things being put on boats. You know, maybe some of the bulwarks had been removed and aluminum had been added to that. It had had different engines, different electrical systems. And on top of all that, it had sunk three and a half times. So sifting through all the layers of 80 years of history, restore Western Flyer to spring 1940. That's a clear objective and goal. But our foundation goes way beyond that. The Sea of Cortez trip really was the dawn of modern marine ecology, looking at the world as a, as a working organism in a marine environment. You know, we have an element of research and education with the idea of restoring it to a working research platform, carrying on that legacy of Ed Ricketts and what John Steinbeck wrote about. It's, it's understanding your your world that you live in. You know, the world that Ed Ricketts lived in was the near tidal of Monterey, California. He got down in the tide pools, he flipped over those rocks, and he started to discover his world, and he wrote about that world. And that's the legacy that we're looking for. It's getting young people back into their environment, get them out on the water, have them dive a little bit deeper. Don't tell them how to understand our environment or how to solve our future environmental problems. Let them discover it and let those ideas flourish. We're a place for, for discovery and learning more than straight educating. You know, Ed Ricketts learned about the marine environment on his own. He was a dropout of Sh University of Chicago and he moved to California and he literally started flipping over rocks and he's a legend in the marine ecology world. So people ask me that a lot. What would, what would Steinbeck or what would Ricketts think of this project? I think they would be, you know, thrilled to this project. You know, we're carrying on this legacy of discovering the world. And that's what Ed Ricketts was all about, was the discovery of our world. You know, his, his landmark book, Between Pacific Tides, is, I think it's the number one longest pressed book at Stanford Press, and it's still standard freshman year marine biology in, in many universities. So his legacy is pretty broad, and uh, he's an unsung hero in this. I think what this trip did, because it was a trip taken by a scientist and a writer, is show the integration of science and scientific thinking and humanistic thinking. As a scientist, you look carefully, you participate, you think, you look at group behavior, you look at colonial animals, etc. And that's kind of what Steinbeck was doing in his writing. He's looking specifically, he's looking at the Grapes of Wrath is full of details. Um, he's looking at groups of people, the Jodes and migrations. And all of those are scientific principles as well. Um, survivability is a word that Ricketts used, is a word that Steinbeck used. So we want students really to understand this intersection between the scientist, which is a particular way of thinking and seeing the world and studying the world, and literature um, isn't necessarily separate, but they can be seen as together. I think that's what makes this unusual, because there are lots of boats and scientific vessels that go out, but this one is going to be not only the boat that Steinbeck and Ricketts took, writer and scientists, but really model programs on the way that their interactions took place. The next real phase was to establish the shape and the backbone of the boat, restore that original shape of the Western Flyer. There was some stationary molds put inside the boat to kind of help the project to hold it together. And as we dug down into the boat, they found that there was more damage than was originally thought. 
you know, some of the damage and some of the rot had gotten pretty deep into some of the framing. But each move that was made along the way was very systematic to retain that original shape. You know, if you just removed all the parts and pieces that were bad on day one, you'd come back in the morning, there'd be a pile of rubble on the ground. So there was a system to each one of those moves. You know, when we started the project, we originally thought it would be about a 60-40. 60% new, 40% original. And now in the hull, as we dove deeper into the hull and found more decay and rot throughout that hull, it's really started to be more like a 90-10. And really it's about 95% new in the hull and 5% original. The keel and some of the backbone timbers but the house, which was removed early on in February of 2019, is actually being restored almost completely to original. So it will be more like 90% original, 10% new. For the first few years of the project, I was still the head shipwright, the project manager for the shipyard. And in 2017, I'd really fallen in love with the project. So I stepped to the other side of the table. I left the shipyard. Now I'm the project manager for the Western Flyer Foundation. I had been doing hard ship riding work for almost 30 years at that point. And this project, it just, it, something grabbed a hold of me. There's a passion to this project. It's the people that come and see the project. We hauled that boat into the building it's currently in, in May of 2015. And within days of putting it into that location, there were people that were coming to see the boat, kind of almost that pilgrimage to see something that, that had a, a mark on their life. And I, I fell in love with that, and it was contagious. You know, I was seeing these people, some younger scientists, some later in life career scientists, just that how much influence this man, Ed Ricketts, had meant on their life. And I think I just knew that I was a hold of something that was so much more than just a standard project. I think people are just awestruck when they can be close to something that was actually a part of someone's life that they really respect and admire and emulate or just want to, you know, acknowledge. Uh, that that writer or scientist has been an important part of their life. So I think the Western Flyer is such an iconic boat because it, the trip was so um, special and remarkable and sends a chill down your spine when you can be at the places where an author or a writer or a scientist was or to see the boat. This is the actual boat that they took down to the Sea of Cortez. That's exciting. It's a project that brings people together and I love that. People want to be a part of it. Early on in the project, we started dismantling the boat. We realized we didn't know what we wanted to do with the wood, but we knew once it went to the landfill, it was gone forever. So we realized there was a place to, to, to help people to, to be part of this project on a grander scale. So one of the partnerships that's kind of come out of this is uh, Ventana Surfboards in Santa Cruz, California. They build hollow core rideable surfboards out of reclaimed recycled materials. I've been supplying Ventana with small pieces of the hull planking and some of the framing and their head craftsman or tying has just turned them into pieces of art. So we had come along some wood from John Steinbeck's first house in Pacific Grove. I was asked to speak at the Steinbeck Festival at the Steinbeck Center in Salinas where Steinbeck was born. I met John Gregg who was also speaking there and he's the owner of the Western Flyer. And I just asked him, I said, hey, do you think we could get some wood from the flyer? And he said, absolutely. And they sailed it down to us from Port Townsend. And uh, we had, uh, twice now we've done that. Um, we've probably made eight to 10 different boards that incorporate Western flyer wood. We're trying to be the most environmentally responsible surf company in the world. And everything that we make has a really high bar for environmental and to some extent social responsibility. They generally are made from trash. Uh, a lot of reclaimed wood from all kinds of really cool historic sources like the Western Flyer. We've got 30 or 35 different partners that donate wood to us and each piece of wood has a story that's much richer and more interesting than, than any new wood that you could buy. There's going to be nails down the middle, boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. So when you get into milling, you're looking for metal, yeah. but some of this color. The, the Western Flyer wood specifically is, when we first got it, I mean you can see on this piece there's red paint on the outside and there's barnacles and we thought it was trash wood but then when you cut into it dug fur is usually really light but it's because the wood that we first got from the hull was from the engine room it's saturated in diesel fuel so you can smell oil and diesel on it but it comes out makes the wood look like a rainbow 
So it's special because it's got the history, but it's also special because it really, really looks unique when we use it in surfboards and other products. The next big chapter would be framing the boat, really. Um, the boat was built with 62 pairs of steam bent frames and 18 pairs of sawn to shape frames in the stern. Once that sawn frames were done in the stern, those steam bent frames were the next really big chapter. And putting those frames really defines the shape of the boat. That's going to be the permanent lasting shape of the boat. You know, the Western Flyer had almost 18 foot long, three inch by four inch white oak frames. And those frames needed to be absolutely perfect if anyone steamed wood before. You know, you can't have any knots, we don't need any cracks, we can't have weird grain run out, very few defects. So I searched for a long time for that wood and I finally found it in Berea, Kentucky. We had it milled in Berea, Kentucky. That wood arrived in early 2019. And one of the most amazing parts of the project was they started the first frame on July 5th, 2019. They steamed and installed that frame. And almost 31 days later, I think it was 32 days later, they had all 62 pairs of frames in that boat. It was an incredible effort. You know, I would tell people on the street, make sure you get down there and watch that. It's a once in a lifetime experience and you're gonna miss out. It's just gonna happen a blink of an eye and it truly did so that was one of those moments the boat went from it made a big transformation for me of a project of of you know optimism and hope into this thing is really going to happen each one of the people involved in the project brings an incredible level of passion for what they're doing. Even the youngest shipwrights, there is something, you know, many of the tools we use are antique tools. Some might be almost a hundred years old. There is a connection to the past and I think we all really gravitate towards that. They're using old hand planes and old chisels and, and broad axes and adds. Those tools are all a hundred years old and it's not a nostalgia, there's nothing better. That tool does the job perfectly for what we need it to do. So it's, it's a kind of an interesting relationship between the wood boat and the wood boat tool. You know, they haven't really gotten any better. Those tools that are pre-World War II, many of these band saws and joiners and table saws and hand planes and chisels are still the superior tool to do the job. Back in 2015, one of the grandchildren of the original builder, Martin Petridge from the Western Boat Company, wanted to come up to Port Townsend and see the boat. And he came to the Port Townsend Shipwrights Co-op and he gets out of his car and the very first thing he says is, I want to see the bandsaw. In 1981, when the Port Townsend Shipwrights was formed, it was a bunch of guys and they didn't have any tools and they had a little bit of cash and they all threw a little bit of money in a hat and they started looking for tools. The first big tool you need when you start a boat yard is a bandsaw. So they all threw a little bit of money in a hat and they went to basically a going out of business sale in a place called the Western Boat Company. At this point in time, the Western Boat Company in the late 70s had finally gone completely out of business and they were selling off the tools. And they bought this large ship's bandsaw and it became a focal point of their business. They built a building around it. We cut thousands of miles of wood on this one particular bandsaw. And as this grandson of the builder starts telling me this story, that this bandsaw was probably built in 1910. The Western Boat Company built the Western Flyer in 1937. And it's the exact same bandsaw that built the Western Flyer. You know, every piece of wood that is cut today to go into the Western Flyer is cut on that very same bandsaw. It's still the same parts and pieces, the moving wheels, the blade turning, and it's pretty interesting connection back to the Western Flyer. And it's now almost become a, a theme. People, the first thing they want to say now is, I want to see the bandsaw, and they want to hear that story for themselves about how this bandsaw has built the boat twice. There's something about that traditional, construction method that, that speaks to certain people, crafting the materials, cutting and sawing and shaping. You know, each piece of wood that we put into a boat is shaped on all four sides and both ends. You know, there's nothing we put into a wood boat that can be bought at a store, at a Home Depot or a hardware store. You know, we buy a board that might be 20 inches wide and we shape a board at the end that's eight or nine or 10 inches wide with a curve and a set and a bend and bevels. So. There's something very gratifying about, you know, creating those beautiful lines of infinity, those shapes that really attract all of us to these boats. I think people just enjoy watching craftsmen do true things. You know, that was a, 
a famous thing that Ed Ricketts would say is, you know, he, he liked true things. And I think there's something about the restoration that is a true thing. It's people crafting and shaping wood, an organic material into a living object. You know, there's something really unique about the wood boat. Uh, the people that come to the festival, the people that come to be part of this industry. I was just speaking to someone earlier today that, you know, he's a 65 year old retiree and he's, his words, I wish I had moved here 35 years ago to be part of this. The next real big phase started in about November of 2019, and that would have been the replanking phase. There were a few hull planks in the boat that we probably could have saved, but we opted to go with 100% replank of the Western Flyer. So that means 100% of the planks came off and 100% went back on. And that was about 14,000 board feet of SIPO, which is the material we chose to use for that. It's an African mahogany. And that project really got started in December of 2019. The first planks went on the boat and they ended up planking the entire boat in about three months with a crew of about eight people consistently. So that really brought us up to where we are now. Our original timeline was to be out of the building and nearing the water by late 2020. And I think that's probably gotten pushed back to our new timeline really is to be out of that building in early 21. You know, our ultimate goal is to get the boat restored, get these next phases done, and get back to the Sea of Cortez. You know, there's something about returning the boat to the Sea of Cortez, the scene of the crime, you know, where this legacy in this novel was written. In the shipwright world, we call the hull deck and house is about a third of a project completed. We still have mechanical, we have rigging, we have an entire classroom research facility and an entire interior that we need to build into this boat. So there's a lot of chapters still to go in this restoration. One of my favorite lines from all of Steinbeck is in the opening chapter of the log from the Sea of Cortez. He says, you break a small piece of coral off a coral reef and that doesn't matter much to the inner tidal. The Japanese shrimp boats are dredging the Sea of Cortez, taking up all the shrimps and that doesn't matter very much to the world. And then he says, bombs are falling overseas and destroying cities, and that doesn't matter very much to the stars. And then he says, either all of it matters or none of it does. And that sense of ecological holism that the smallest gesture can make an impact just as large, dramatic gestures, I think is something we really need to think about and hold in our minds today. And later on he says we need to look from the tide pool to the stars and back again. So you need to study things carefully, you need to look, you need to participate like the scientists, and we need to speculate like philosophers. We need both faculties of mind to be whole and to be human.